So welcome to lecture in our mechanical operations course. So far in this course we have reviewed some fundamentals of particulate behavior. How do particles interact, how do they flow, how do they get transported, how do they stick to surfaces, how do they stick to each other and so on. So from this class onwards we are going to start talking about some specific uh, processes or operations um, involving particles. And again, um, as we defined in the first class, mechanical operations are to be distinguished from normal operations or processes on the basis of the fact that they primarily involve mechanical forces as the um, field or, or influence that causes the process to happen. So the first example we are going to talk about is uh, something that is uh, you know, obviously a hot area right now which is nanotechnology. Um, nanotechnology, particularly the synthesis of nanoparticles presents kind of a, an interesting combination of mechanical operations and chemical processes depending on from which direction you approach the nano dimension. There are two methods of making nanoparticles. One is called bottom up synthesis, the other is called top down synthesis. Bottom up synthesis techniques typically involve a lot of chemistry. They depend upon reactions between molecules that cause the nanoparticle to form. The top down approach on the other hand is a purely mechanical operation. You start with particles that are micron size and you actually break them down into nano sizes by applying various mechanical forces. So that is uh, the first example we are going to look at of a um, mechanical operation. So we will do PowerPoint this time just for a change and so uh, the, um, the outline uh, this may take me a couple of classes to cover fully. Um, we are going to define some terms what is nanoscale, what is nanoscience, what is nanotechnology, talk about some applications of nanotechnology and then primarily focus on this part the synthesis of um, nanoparticles, um, bottom up techniques, top down techniques and then the characterization. So what is nano? <laughs> you have all seen the nano car right that is not what we are going to talk about. Nano in our context is a linear dimension. It comes from the Greek word for dwarf. It is about a billionth of a meter. So by the way this is um, also in your um, in that particle characterization web course there are actually four lectures that deal with this topic. and. Um, um, so this PowerPoint is also in that same NPTEL course. So you do not have to take very extensive notes uh, and some of the fine print may be difficult for you to see but it is available um, on, on YouTube so you can always take a look at it. But nano dimension starts here. It um, varies from about 1 nanometer up to about 100 nanometers. 1 to 100 nanometers is traditionally defined as a nano range. And if you look at some of the uh, things that we are familiar with which are larger than that size, small insects, human hair, red blood cells, bacteria are all above the nano scale. Viruses, DNA, molecular structures and so on are in the nano scale. So nano is very, very small. Now I differentiated between nano scale, nano science and nano technology. So when we say nano scale does it mean that um, the object has to be nano in every dimension for it to be considered nano scale? No, only one of the dimensions needs to be in the nano scale. So you can have a very, very thin fiber that is very, very long like for example carbon nanotubes can be several millimeters in length but that diameter is of the order of nanometers and that is considered nano scale. Interestingly the, the definition of nano itself you know people would say that 1000 nanometers 
uh, that should be micrometers. The 1000 nanometers is nanoscale, no. However, 999 nanometers is nanoscale, yes. You know, just <coughs> what is nano itself is something that is very much open to debate. As I mentioned earlier, the human hair is not a nanoscale material. So what is nanoscience? It is a study of the unique physical and chemical characteristics exhibited by particles in the 1 to 999 nanometer range, mostly 1 to 100. Traditionally, 1 to 100 nanometers is considered the nano domain. It turns out that nano scale is of interest to us because many materials change properties as you go to the nano dimension. And that is the reason or the incentive for going to the nano dimension. So some of these properties that change significantly at nano scale, optical. Um, many materials will actually exhibit a different color when you break them down to nano size compared to larger dimensions. Light transmission characteristics change significantly. Electrical properties can completely be transformed as you go to nano dimensions. A resistor can become a conductor. Uh, a semiconductor can become conducting. All of these things are possible simply by changing the dimension of, of the material. You can impart magnetic properties or, or remove magnetic properties again by approaching nano dimensions. As chemical engineers, catalysis is a very important process for us. And when you use a catalyst, the primary consideration is the surface area of the catalyst because that it's a surface of the catalyst that promotes chemical reactions. So if you can produce more area per unit volume of catalyst material, your process economics are greatly improved. And so catalysis, uh, the, the catalytic properties of a material are hugely influenced by uh, going to a nano dimension. Phase change properties, electrochemical properties, you know, there are many, many properties that exhibit as a significant change as you go to the nano dimension. So how do you differentiate nanotechnology from nanoscience? Application of nanoscale materials and nanoscience principles at sufficiently large scale to impact society is called nanotechnology. You know, nanoscience is basically people playing in the lab. You know, interesting, but no practical use to society. Nanotechnology is taking that nanoscience and actually converting it into useful products for consumers at scale. So a, a nanotechnologist would uh, leverage these unique properties. A nanoscientist would study the properties. A nanotechnologist would leverage the unique properties at nano dimensions. A nanotechnologist would take advantage of these properties, of the beneficial properties, but control the harmful consequences. You know, the fact that, uh, for example, chemical reactivity is very high at nano dimensions is good when you are trying to use that chemical reactivity in a purposeful manner. But on the other hand, if the reactivity causes toxic, toxic effects, for example, toxicity is going to get much worse as you approach the nano dimensions. So many of these, um, these unique properties are, are kind of like a double-edged sword. Sometimes it helps you, sometimes it hurts you. So um, managing the, the, the uh, positive and the negative aspects of nanomaterials is something that a nanotechnologist has to, has to do. Optimizing without compromising. Again, uh, when you are trying to optimize the properties of nanomaterials, um, you try to drive to finer and finer dimensions. You try to pack more and more atoms on the outer periphery of the particle because all of that gives you enhanced reactivity, interaction and so on. But you do not want to compromise the environment, for example, or health and hygiene. So a nanotechnologist job is to do that. Nanotechnology is interdisciplinary by nature because it represents a confluence of engineering and science disciplines. Nanotechnology is based on nanoscience. You cannot do nanotechnology without nanoscience and vice versa. Nanoscience by itself again just re uh, remains a, you know, a lab tool. You, you need a nanotechnologist to take the results and actually make something with it. Um, nanotechnology was introduced by Feynman back in 1959 and he said uh, when he famously said there is plenty of room at the bottom. His idea was that micro, micro technology 
or later to be known as nanotechnology is a frontier to be pushed back like you know pressure, vacuum, temperature. He basically said just like we go to high pressure and low pressure we sh and achieve um, certain effects because of that and just like we go to high temperature and low temperature <coughs> and use that uh, for various reasons. Similarly, <coughs> dimension is a parameter that we can play with in order to get beneficial results. He also said ordinary machines could build small machines which could build smaller machines to atomic level. So it's really talking about nanoscale manipulation of particles and nanoparticle synthesis itself from in the bottom up approach is, is where you try to manipulate matter at molecular level and try to get these molecules to self assemble to form nano sized clusters. So Feynman was um, I think way ahead of his time in terms of his understanding of nanotechnology and how it could be deployed. But it took 22 years after Feynman's article for the first paper on molecular nanotechnology to be published and that was in 1981. Nano is all around us. There are many, many natural structures that are <coughs> nano dimensional in character, the human bone, silk thread, spider web, rat's teeth, peacock feather and so on. Um, and actually here on campus we have many people who are very active in nanotechnology. Um, one of them is uh, of course Professor Pradeep in Department of Chemistry. Um, I just took some excerpts from an interview that he gave to the Hindu back in 2007. Uh, term of nanotechnology refers to a broad range of technology which involve the utilization of the properties of nanoscale objects. Uh, these properties are unique and again at the scale of nanometer many disciplines converge. So nanotechnology is like a fusion technology. Why is it necessary to know about nanotechnology? Uh, every molecular assembly in nature, nature likes nanotechnology but from basically a bottom up approach. Nature takes atoms, builds molecules, it takes molecules, builds nano dimensional materials. Natural roots are energy efficient, green and sustainable. Uh, an understanding of nanotechnology will help us to do things better with improved efficiency in a more eco friendly and sustainable manner. And of course the other reason people like to, to delve into nanotechnology is just curiosity. The fact that everything behaves differently at nanoscale is fascinating to scientists. So even if there is no technological application nano scientists would still pursue the science but it is good that there is nanotechnology that is now enabling us to make full use of these uh, nano dimensional materials. A more recent article again uh, Pradeep's in uh, Times of India talks about uses of nanotechnology, uh, interaction of nanotechnology with biology to create new materials, bio nano is now the new catch word you know it's bio there is nano now there is bio nano. Many problems such as uh, in, uh, what is associated with water, food, health, environment um, can be solved using bio nano technology. In particular uh, I am sure you must you probably read about the recent initiative where a company has been launched that is uh, making water purifiers using nanotechnology that removes arsenic from groundwater. And this is a extremely low energy solution because it just depends upon flow of the water through a, a bed of nano particles. So there is no energy involved um, except to flow the water through the bed. All right, so what are some nano engineered products? Semiconductor industry uses nano technology to a large extent. In fact, uh, you know in many industries nano technology is uh, old news. For example, if you look at hard disk drives, you know magnetic data storage, the way this works is there is a, a read write head that flies over a disk on which data are recorded and read. The flying height of the head above the disk back in the late 50s when Feynman published his article was about 90 nanometers. Today it is about 4 nanometers, it is called contact recording. The head is virtually flying in contact with the disk. So if you talk to people in the you know the magnetic data storage industry they will say nanotechnology is old news, you know it is nothing new. So just uh, it is something I should caution you that when people say nano 
it does not necessarily mean state of the art technology. In many industries, nano is obsolete technology and people have moved on to pico technology and femto technology and so on. So again remember that nano is simply a dimension, it is not a certification that something is high tech. Ceramics for use in demanding environments. Ceramics are used very widely because they offer many advantages. They, they essentially have all the rigidity and hardness characteristics of, of metals but they are extremely lightweight. And so ceramics offer some significant advantages but ceramics can be attacked in certain environments particularly the more uh, high temperature environments, corrosive environments and so on. And the use of nanotechnology has um, helped us um, stretch the use of ceramics for in, in more demanding environments. Polymers, you know plastics, rubber, elastomers are again wonderful materials because they offer so many advantages in terms of lightweight, low cost, clean manufacturing and so on. But they also have certain properties that are not as good as the harder met metals, you know again things like rigidity or strength or conductivity, they do not really compare very well with metals. But by using nanoparticles embedded in polymers, these are materials are called nanocomposites, you can greatly enhance the functional properties of these, um, of these polymers. Coatings, particularly transparent coatings with UV IR absorption properties as well as abrasion resistance is something again that nanomaterials use. And um, uh, this is very important for example in building materials or in the manufacture of telescope lens um, or, or any kind of glass surface where you require good properties of transmission, uh, light transmission but at the same time you want shielding with respect to certain types of radiation and you also require high resistance to abrasion. Um, nano additives are, are employed quite extensively. Um, again static dissipative and conductive films, um, many of the plastic films that, that you use either packaging materials or coating materials um, suffer from the fact that they are just not as conductive as metallic films. But by, by using nano additives you can improve their static dissipation and conductivity properties. Enhanced heat transfer fluids, again this is an area where there is a lot of active research going on here on campus. Um, various heat transfer fluids are used in chemical process industries. Um, have you taken a course in heat transfer yet? So when you do you learn about heat exchangers which pretty much rely upon fluids that you know transfer heat from one surface to another. But the heat transfer characteristics of these fluids, I mean fluids in general are not as conductive as solids, right. So how do you maximize the conductivity of, of these fluids? One of the approaches is to uh, suspend nanoparticles in fluids. When you do that, you find that the, the conductivity of um, both the thermal conductivity as well as electrical conductivity of fluids is greatly enhanced over the base fluid. Catalysis I mentioned earlier, a um, lot of you know skin care, pharma applications are now using technology. You will see a lot of um, sunscreen products being advertised as being um, nano technology. Ultrafine polishing, uh, if you are trying to get an extremely smooth finish on a surface to nano dimensions you have to use nano materials to do the polishing. So that is another application where nano materials are widely used. So I mentioned polymers and the use of filler materials or nano materials as fillers in polymers is again emerging as a very important discipline. There is a lot of research going on here on that in that area. Basically that is done to improve the viscoplastic properties of these polymers. The filler materials are typically inorganic, glass fiber, talcum, kaolin. The dosage actually if you are, if your filler material is not nano dimensional, the dosage can be very high. 
in order to get a functional property enhancement. For example, as much as 20 to 60 percent. But if you use a filler material in a nano dimension, the same functional enhancement can be achieved with a much lower concentration, in typically in the 2 to 5 percent. So nanoparticles or nano fillers offer the advantage of achieving equivalent or better functional properties, but with much reduced usage of material. Uh, some of the first nano composite was bentonite which was developed by Toyota for use in their cars. So the point is um, even tiny amounts can have dramatic impact. So with, when you use nano fillers you do not have to use very high volume percentage of the filler material. You can achieve um, dramatic effects even with very very small amounts of the filler material. Well, if you look at the whole array of nanotechnology applications, there is a lot of them. EMI shielding, chemical gas sensing, you know sensors is one area where nanomaterials offer huge advantages. For example, if you are trying to detect the leak of uh, toxic gases, the most sensitive instrument for detecting chemicals in air is what, do you know? What is the most sensitive instrument that can detect smells and chemicals? The human nose. There is nothing that matches the capability of the human nose. We can smell things that are in the trillion parts per trillion levels. Uh, there is no instrument developed that can do that you know, repeatably and reproducibly. But nanotechnology gets us close. So that with use of nano sensors, again the point is what you are trying to do with uh, nano sensors is you are trying to pack a lot of atoms into a very small area. So it improves the adsorption capability of the, of the sensor and therefore it, it improves the sensing capability of the sensor. Um, so sensors is one area where again nanomaterials are widely used and there are several other applications as well. Another interesting one from a chemical engineering viewpoint is in marine applications, you know ships what we find is something that is called uh, biofouling. Um, the, the surfaces of the ship or whatever vessel that are immersed in water for a long time start to develop a bio coating, it is called biofouling. And uh, if it gets to be too thick, it actually begins to affect the, um, the properties of, uh, um, of that particular material. Uh, it can lead to corrosion effects, you know, basically it leads to increased maintenance needs, um, increased drag resistance when the, when the vessel is actually moving in water. So you want to minimize this fouling or biofouling and it turns out that if you can um, coat the, the, the surfaces that are immersed with uh, coatings that are where nanoparticles are embedded then they, they provide continuous protection. They slowly leach out through the layer, the coating layer and, and give you long term antimicrobial protection of the surface. Textiles, um, it turns out that uh, nano materials can be used um, in an embedded manner in nylon, polypropylene and so on and they provide various types of protection. They provide antimicrobial protection. Um, in fact, um, you know in battlefields as you know people wear Kevlar vests to protect themselves. But Kevlar only gives you so much protection. When you have close range combat, hand to hand combat, uh, you require much greater hardness and rigidity of the Kevlar vest. Turns out that um, nanoparticles embedded in Kevlar can give you orders of magnitude better protection compared to unfilled Kevlar material. So that is another example of where nanotechnology is actually saving lives of soldiers. Permanent coatings, um, coatings in general are very important because many metal surfaces if left open are highly reactive and they will start oxidizing, rusting, corroding. So Coating is, is a, an important process in many applications and most, 
coating properties are improved by uh, use of nanomaterials. Uh, catalysts allows thinner layers, less usage of precious metals, gives you very, very stable solid dispersions. So in cars, the catalytic converters that are used to prevent pollution are taking advantage of uh, nanotechnology because emission standards are getting tighter everywhere in the world. And the only way you can meet the, the tighter uh, pollution emission standards is by adopting technologies such as nanotechnology. And of course, in petroleum refining as well, which is also a catalysis intensive process, nanotechnology is uh, finding increased use. Fuel cells, sunscreen I talked about, semiconductor polishing. All right, so what is common to all of them? Nanoparticles. You cannot do nanoscience, you cannot do nanotechnology without nanoparticles. So nanoparticles are the fundamental building blocks of nanotechnology. So the starting point for any nanotechnology application is the preparation of nanostructured materials and devices. So synthesis of nanoparticles and their characterization are obviously extremely crucial. So here is a, a slide that talks about the two techniques of nanoparticle synthesis, bottom up and top down. Again, the differentiation between them is in bottom up synthesis of nanoparticles, you start with atoms, you build molecules, you take the molecules, you assemble them in a very controlled manner and you get nano dimensional materials. Whereas in the case of the top down methodology, you start with particles that are larger than nano in size and then you fragment them to achieve nano dimensions. So if you look at typical <laughs> bottom up processes, uh, and we'll talk about some of these in more detail, colloidal processes, liquid phase synthesis, gas phase synthesis, vapor phase synthesis are all examples of bottom up techniques of growing nanoparticles. The two top down techniques that we will focus on come under the category of mechanical operations. The first is ball milling, um, particularly high energy ball milling. Conventional ball milling can get you down to micron sizes. But if you want to use ball mills to get to nano sizes, you have to use what are known as high energy ball mills. Sono fragmentation is a technique that is less widely used. We are actually doing a lot of research in this area in, in, our, in our laboratory. This is using high intensity acoustic fields to break down particles from large sizes to smaller sizes. So we will quickly run through some of the, um, the bottom up processes. Colloidal processes. It is also called molecular self assembly. It gives you highly engineered nanoparticles. You can custom design a nanoparticle using this approach. You can give it not only the <coughs> composition you want, not only the uh, physical properties you want, you can even give these particles the shape that you want, the structure that you want by manipulating atoms at a time and using what are known as ligands to produce nano clusters. So you take a few atoms and molecules and actually move them around using extremely tiny probes um, and then you position them where you want and you attach adjacent particles through surfactants for example to provide that interparticle cohesion and finally you achieve a structure that is exactly what you are looking for. So if you want a highly controlled nano material which is assembled to specification, then the so called colloidal process um, or molecular self assembly process is the way to go. Of course the downside is very difficult to do and very difficult to make in volumes and you can make you know a few micrograms for use in your lab, but are you going to be able to do this and, and make kilograms or tons of nanomaterials a day, very unlikely. In fact, most of the bottom up processes suffer from this drawback. They are just not suited to scaling up, but they do give you extremely high purity. They do give you very good control over the physical and chemical composition of the nanomaterial, but the penalty you pay is that it is very expensive, um, very hard to control, require very high 
technical expertise to design a process and run this process and you can only produce small quantities anyway. Vapor phase synthesis actually involves a lot of chemical engineering, chemistry. So what you do here is you actually produce a vapor phase mixture that contains the material that you are trying to synthesize in nanoparticle form. But initially the vapor phase is in a supersaturated state. What you do is you suddenly make this the mixture thermodynamically unstable. So for example, this is a case where you are inserting what is called a cold finger into a vapor mixture that contains the nano material in vapor form. So when you do that what happens? You get condensation, you get nucleation. So you nucleate nano droplets or nano particles near this cold finger that you are inserting and you, you collect it as a, as a powder down below. So what you are doing here is you take a vapor phase mixture and you render it thermodynamically unstable and that causes nucleation to begin. So you, you go from a supersaturated vapor or a chemical supersaturation state to spontaneous homogeneous nucleation. The two requirements are degree of supersaturation must be sufficient. So the vapor mixtures must be sufficiently supersaturated so that when you give it this shock you immediately and spontaneously condense the nano uh, nuclei. And of course uh, the reaction and condensation kinetics must be favorable as well. So it is not enough if nucleation is thermodynamically feasible. The kinetics must also be in favor of the nucleation happening. And also you have to be able to truncate it. You know once nucleation happens and you have formed the nano materials you have to be able to stop the process. And the way that is done is by relieving the uh, supersaturation by condensing in a non-critical location or the reaction of vapor phase molecules on the resulting particles. If you do not quench the process immediately what can happen is once the nanoparticles are formed <coughs> heterogeneous nucleation can begin. So additional vapors can start condensing on top of the nanoparticles that you have already formed. So the nanoparticles will start growing in size and eventually they may exceed the nano dimension. So you have to have a way of truncating the process so that as soon as you have achieved materials of the required nano dimension you relieve the supersaturation in such a way that heterogeneous condensation does not happen on particles that are already nucleated because otherwise particle growth will begin. If you remember the trimodal distribution we had sketched earlier the first mode is nucleation the second mode is growth. If you are trying to make nanoparticles you do not want the growth phase to happen. You want the uh, process to be truncated as soon as nucleation happens. So um, rapid quenching after nucleation will prevent this particle growth. You can do this by removing the source of supersaturation or by slowing the kinetics. Uh, we talked about coagulation or cohesion right. Now in the case of vapor phase synthesis the coagulation rate is proportional to the square of number concentration. So the higher the concentration of nucleated um, nanoparticles the greater will be the coagulation rate. It is number dependent rather than size dependent. Uh, so um, again what this says is if you want to prevent coagulation you have to control the nucleation process so that as soon as you have formed the minimum number of particles that you need stop the process so that coagulation does not begin. As you increase the temperature coalescence can start again the differentiation between coag coagulation and coalescence is coagulation gives you weakly bonded reversible agglomerates whereas coalescence gives you strongly bonded sintered agglomerates which are very very difficult to break apart so it is virtually a irreversible um, coagulation process. Of course at intermediate temperatures partially centered uh, particles will form which tend to be non-spherical in nature. So this control of coagulation coalescence is very critical in forming nanoparticles by vapor phase synthesis. 
course as we have seen before nanoparticles in gas phase always have a tendency to agglomerate. Loosely agglomerated particles can be redispersed, but again coalesced particles cannot be hard or partly partially sintered agglomerates cannot be fully re, um, redispersed. So, especially if you are running a higher temperature process to make the nanoparticles it is extremely important to control coagulation. Liquid phase synthesis is another method that is used for nanoparticle synthesis bottom up uh, particularly used for semiconductor nanoparticles also called quantum dots. The method that is most commonly used is called sol gel which is used to synthesize glass ceramic and glass ceramic composite nanoparticles and here the dispersion is stabilized by capping the particles with ligands. So, you essentially by using surfactants um, as we have discussed briefly previously you can actually prevent agglomeration from happening. You can cap the, the formed nanoparticles on both ends so that they are not reactive anymore so that they do not have a tendency to attach to nearby particles. So, in the sol gel method um, you take molecular precursors and you immerse them in water or alcohol and you stir this mixture until you form a gel that is why it is called the sol gel process. This gel is dried at 100 degrees centigrade for 24 hours and then ground to a powder. Now, what does that mean? It is actually a combination of bottom up and top down right. It is bottom up because you start with molecular precursors and form this soup or gel, but then once the gel is dried you, you use a top down process. You take this um, gel and you actually dry it and then grind it down to achieve the sizes you want. So, sol gel is um, one of the few processes that combines bottom up and top down methodologies. If you want to get a, a, a better or stronger nano uh, material there is a process called calcining where you actually heat it at 500 to 1200 degrees centigrade for 2 hours in order to improve the properties of the, um, of the powder. Um, so, the advantage of the sol gel method of course, is you can take precursors at molecular level mix them and get enhanced properties better control high purity high degree of homogeneity. So, it is a method that is particularly suited to production of nano sized ceramic powders. The reason that it is particularly suited for ceramic powder powders is that ceramics grind very easily. Ceramics combine two almost conflicting properties they are very hard they are also very fragile. So, um, when you use a grinding process or the acoustic process we will talk about later ceramics actually respond much better than metals. So, this process of sol gel which requires grinding of the powder actually works much better with ceramic particles than with metals. In fact, if you want to use this process for metal you have to increase the fragility of the metal the brittleness of the metal. The way you do that, how do you make a metal brittle? Any idea? Suppose you are asked to come up with a process to take iron and make it brittle, how would you do it? Heat it. Well, um, yeah, I mean, the, the treatment that is used is just cryogenic immersion, you just freeze it, you do not even have to heat it, you just can just freeze the material to extremely low temperature. And that will so that is used that is used as a pre treatment in um, in this process. Gas phase synthesis is very similar to the vapor phase synthesis that we talked about earlier, except that in this case you um, you actually take the material in solid form and you vaporize it and achieve super saturation in this gas phase and then you cool the gas in order to have nucleation happen. Now, so typically solid precursors are used you take a solid material vaporize the material. So, that you get molecules of the material into this gas carrier and then you cool the gas to make nanoparticles. Some of the methods that are used to vaporize the, uh, the gas or inert gas condensation pulse laser ablation spark discharge generation ion sputtering and so on. You can also use this technique with liquid or vapor precursors and these are some of the techniques that are used in that case. 
so in the case of inert gas condensation um, what you do is you take the solid it is particularly useful when you have metals that have reasonable evaporation rates at attainable temperatures. If you have to heat the material to extremely high temperatures to get them to vaporize method does not work. But if you can take uh, the material and heat it at a reasonable temperature to evaporate it into a background gas, then you can mix this vapor with a cold inert gas to reduce the temperature and as you do nucleation starts to happen. One of the benefits of this technique is you can also include reactive gases like oxygen in the cold gas stream to prepare compounds. For example, the metal may be let us say iron, so you take a solid iron, vaporize it and then the inert gas that you use to cool, you introduce a little bit of oxygen in it, the nanoparticle that forms will be iron oxide, right. So you start with an iron solid precursor but you can actually make iron oxide nanoparticles. So that is a, um, a neat application of this technique where you can uh, introduce a reactive gas and make nano compounds. So the other techniques pulse laser ablation, um, it is a different technique to vaporize. So instead of simply heating, if you have a material that requires high energy to vaporize, then you can use a pulse laser to vaporize. It is a good process to use in terms of controls, however the uh, amount that you produce is very small because you can only do the laser ablation at, at a particular location, so you are getting a few atoms off every time. So clearly it is not a scalable process but it can vaporize materials that cannot easily be vaporized such as silicon, MgO, titania and so on. Spark discharge again different way you actually um, you, you take electrodes that are made of the material to be vaporized, charge them, achieve a breakdown voltage, arc forms across the electrodes, it vaporizes material. This is used particularly for nickel, again very small amounts of nanoparticles are produced. Ion sputtering, take a solid that you are trying to vaporize, hit it with the ions, it is called a sputtering process and that vaporizes atoms. But low pressure is required which makes downstream processing difficult. Okay, uh, let us uh, stop at this point, we will continue this um, in the next class. So just add a couple more processes on the bottom up side and then we will start talking about the top down methods of nanoparticle synthesis. Uh, any questions? <coughs>